Amen. Uh, when I was young, uh, and the music was really, really good in the service, the pastor would come up at the time of the sermon and say, you know what, I don't think we're going to preach today. <laughs> because the message is in the music. And that's how I feel hearing Guy and also Gene sing. So it's been a pleasure to be up here and to see you all out there. I hope to meet you later. Um, let me please begin by saying that Reverend Sophia, who we all know for her warmth and compassion, is such a blessing. It's such a blessing. She makes me smile as soon as she enters the room, and I'm sure the same is true for you. And so I'm so grateful and honored that my sister and dear seminary friend invited me to join you this morning in her absence. The wonderful things she mentioned about the congregation, Charlene, Guy, Jean, Chalet, and Allison uh, are indeed true. May peace be with her as she enjoys these sabbatical days. In fact, for all of us, the Sabbath is our break in time from routine demands, providing an opportunity to slow down, rest, and rejoice. Sunday, as the saying goes, is a day of the week to stop and smell the roses. So for a moment, let us pause and imagine roses in front of us, beautiful roses, any color you desire. Breathe in and smell those roses. Now imagine yourself touching those roses, however gently, however roughly, the rose feels it and is changed. And as we draw our hands back, we too are changed. For a short while this morning, I'd like to speak about the connections between courage, encouragement, and change. All around us, there are portraits of courage. Somewhere across the city this week, a young girl mustered enough courage to answer a difficult question in the classroom. Somewhere a young boy in a martial arts studio tried over and over to break a wooden board with his foot. Somewhere a woman who's recovering from surgery convinced herself to complete physical therapy to ensure her long-term health, although PT depletes her energy. We, each of us, experience anxiety on some level every day. And every time we affirm ourselves in the midst of that difficult moment, however minor or major, we exercise courage. It isn't always easy, though, right? Sometimes it can be difficult to view ourselves as courageous. So many cultures and legends celebrate the lion, king of the jungle, or the bear, queen of the forest, or the eagle as the epitome of courage. These symbols suggest that courage must have a mighty or imposing presence, a certain grandeur or capacity to defeat one's foes or enemies. Today, however, I welcome you to join me on a much more nuanced exploration of courage. In philosophical and theological circles, there is a school of thought called existentialism, which posits that when we are born and thrust into existence, we learn very soon that we are finite beings, that our lives have an end or excuse me, that our lives begin and end. They say that our awareness of that end makes us anxious. Why? Because we hope, of course, to live for as long as possible. Life naturally strives to actualize itself. Our human biology is an example of life naturally striving to actualize itself because our bodies are innate, innately wired to sustain themselves. 
I'm so glad we're able to breathe without having to think about converting oxygen to carbon dioxide. I wouldn't get anything else done. Our cardiovascular system circulates blood throughout our bodies without our approval or consent. And for those of us who love food, isn't it wonderful we don't have to worry too much about actively digesting it? So yes, our bodies are great examples of life naturally striving to actualize itself. When the conditions are favorable, these processes basically happen automatically. But it gets complicated because human life is much more than biological functions. We are physical beings who move through the world. We are social beings who long for connection and understanding. We are political beings who organize ourselves into systems of governance. We are economic beings who recognize the value of goods and services and skills. We are rational beings who attempt to make sense of the universe by asking questions of why and how. We are emotional beings who yearn to be felt and understood. We are creative beings who adorn the world with our imaginations. And we are spiritual beings who aim to be united with the eternal, caring always about the manifestation of love, friendship, and justice in our local and global communities. And so it goes without saying that we are beautifully complex, and it is within this complexity that we might continue appreciating the place of courage in our daily lives. Actualizing ourselves in these contexts daily requires courage. In other words, self-actualization in social, political, and economic situations requires self-affirmation. When the young girl who musters enough courage to answer that difficult question in the classroom, risking the embarrassment of sounding unintelligent, speaks up anyway, she affirms herself. The young boy in the martial arts studio who tried over and over to break the wooden board with his foot, he kicks and kicks and kicks. It hurts. He cries, he tries again, the wooden board breaks, he affirms himself. The same is true for the woman recovering from surgery. Restoring herself to health, that's self-affirmation as she continues becoming who she's created to be. Though we stand somewhere between the polarities of being and non-being, self-affirmation is counterproductive if we don't take seriously the importance of affirming others. We don't exist for the sake of serving ourselves. We are here to serve each other. A well-known 20th century minister, theologian, and professor named Howard Thurman, who some of us may be familiar with, tells a great story that I'd like to share with you. He once delivered a three-part sermon series titled Growing in Love. Part one was simply growing in love of self, part two was growing in love of others, and part three was growing in love of God. In the final minutes of part two, growing in love of others, Thurman shares a brief story about a man who was headed to the altar to leave a gift. And there standing before the altar, the man remembers that someone should be with him there, but that person isn't there because that person has something against him. The man puts down the gift, not at the altar, but at the exact spot where the memory arose. He leaves. He vehemently goes up and down the highways and byways, sniffing the air for the man until he can find him and say, come with me. I can't make my offering if I don't have your hand in my hand. And they walk back to the altar, joined hands, and there they went before God. The man utters, how can I be happy in God's presence if I know that something between me and you 
keep God's presence from being in our midst. I cannot be happy in heaven if my brother is in hell. I will have to find him and come back before I can claim my place. This story reminds me of a post circulating on Instagram not too long ago that reads, you can't treat people like garbage and worship God at the same time. Courage is inward affirmation. Encouragement is outward affirmation. And as children of faith, affirming ourselves carries the responsibility of affirming others. What is encouragement but the act of affirming another person? Like the man in this story, affirming others might mean righting a wrong. In other instances, in other instances, it can simply mean seeing someone by greeting them or celebrating someone's accomplishment or providing moral and financial support or by doing a favor or giving a gift. We can also affirm people systemically by enacting policies and laws that promote equity and justice for all, helping especially those most in need. There are infinite ways to affirm ourselves and others. I think that is my central offering today, that this is courage and encouragement. Courage and encouragement lead to miraculous changes within us and around us. And that's what led me to today's readings. The opening words from Octavia Butler's Parable of the Sower give us such wonderful context. She tells the story of a young girl who creates community and a pathway for new life in a crumbling world. One simple belief sustains them, which is all that we touch, we change. All that we change, changes us. The only lasting truth is change. God is change. Our ability to create a future together depends on us being sources of inspiration in our own lives and in each other's. And though it may not always feel like things are moving along, rest assured, just look to your left. I mean that, look to your left, you know. But if you look to your right, all around us, you see a portrait of courage and portraits of revolutionary change. That's what Margaret Danner's poem, Garnishing the Aviary, reminds us. It's a poem about birds shedding their feathers as a ritual despite living in a cage in a zoo. The poem suggests they much rather be free and yet together they persist. They actualize and affirm themselves in the midst of their existential situation. And the words go, our molting days are in their twilight stage. These lengthy, dreaded suns of draggling plumes. These days of moods that swiftly alternate between the former preen and a downcast rage or crestfallen lag are fading out. The initial bloom, exotic, dazzling in its indigo, tangerine splendor. This rare, conflicting coat had to be shed. Our drooping feathers turn all shades and we spew this unamicable aviary, gag upon the worm and fling our loosening quill. We make a riotous spread upon the dust and mire that beds us. But we do not chew so quickly. The shades of the pin feathers resulting from this chaotic push, those still exotic, blend in more easily on the wings of the birds surrounding them, garnishing the aviary, burnishing this zoo. So church, in these October days, we are blessed to see a shedding and burnishing of our own. 
leaves changing in an array of fiery brilliance remind us that we don't have to be mighty alone. We can color the world with our collective courage. May it be so, and so it is. Amen.